thank you all for coming. My name is Evan Miyazono. You'll see me around Slack and GitHub as Miyazono. And you will also see this logo um, as the Protocol Labs research contribution to all of our logo ecosystem. Um, so when you see that, this is where, or like, that is what it represents. Um, the idea is that it's a blueprint um, in the research phase of things. Uh, and what I plan to cover today is enough to give you a sense of why Protocol Labs Research is a separate group, uh, or like a unnamed interface within Protocol Labs, and some of the motivation behind what Protocol Labs Research is trying to do. And to be fair, this is all my interpretation of it. Um, but I think that it gives you a cohesive, it provides a cohesive view of uh, how different ideas will interplay with each other and what the structure of Protocol Labs as a research and development and deployment company and lab is. Um, part of that will come into taking all of these ideas and topics that you hear used as, and um, you can trace very fundamentally into Protocol Labs that may not have any clear structure or a um, relationship to each other. And I'll get into uh, the answers to these two questions by explaining why we often, or by explaining why we often uh, describe Protocol Labs as a research development and deployment lab. Um, I'll go into what the focus of research is, as well as answering the specific question towards the end of why, why is Protocol Labs awarding grants? If you didn't know Protocol Labs is awarding grants, then I'm very glad you're here. And there'll be a fair number of details about that at the end. As like a meta note, this 90-minute session will include only about 10 minutes of me talking, and then we will start working on ideas at the forefront of research as it pertains to the problems that we're interested in. And by we, I mean we people in this room, not we protocol labs as a ambiguous or royal we. So jumping into answering the first problem, I will say that you may have seen this image. Um, it's a nice cartoon of the pipeline where ideas are generated in research, turned into specifications, and then through development and deployment, eventually create tools that give humans superpowers, in theory. But some of, there are many things that are lost in the simplification that is um, this nice, well-abstracted idea. And one of those things lost is the truth that progress is not inevitable. Uh, often you'll have ideas that die and never make it to a spec. You'll see that there are ideas that will die at many places along this pipeline. And I would argue that most ideas actually die. And to be fair, I would say that it's probably a good thing. There is such a thing as a bad idea, and not all ideas should be turned into tools that people have access to. Um, either because they would be very bad tools or they would violate a law of physics and you'd spend an infinite amount of time trying to make them happen. But there are definitely ideas that get lost along the way. And to highlight two of them, I would point out the first electric car from 1884. Um, and that was a technology that was sad to sit on for over 100 years. Um, but even worse, potentially, is the fact that the first steam-powered motor, essentially, was the Aleopile 
built by Hero of Alexander in the first century AD, and the first actually useful steam pump came a millennium and a half later. And if that doesn't make you feel cheated or hit you in the gut, I, I don't know what would. Uh, imagining us being that far along, that much further along technologically. And so the reason that we built, we are building this research development and deployment lab, the way that Juan convinced me to join was that he told me we are going to make sure that ideas aren't just generated and thrown into a publication to get buried somewhere. We're going to try and make reliable forward progress as an organization and ensure that humanity doesn't lose information or ideas or understanding or skills or technologies and possibly most importantly, lose rights. And I would argue that it's, well, I will not resist the claim that that is an ambitious goal. And so I would love to move forward by answering the question of how do you go about doing that? And as a research lab, we start with a set of values. And these are just core beliefs, um, things like the fact that every human should have access to all of humanity's knowledge and have whatever it, they need to be able to expand on that. Um, people should have the freedoms in the digital realm that we provide everyone in their physical interactions, like a right to free speech, privacy, right to assembly, right to communicate with whoever you want without having to rely on a third party. Um, and also the belief that if you're going to do something, you should do it well. I think that if you try to, if you try and narrow down that set of beliefs to some smaller subset, you will lose understanding of why we do some of the things that we do at Protocol Labs. Um, and with those values, we choose tools that can work synchronous, like work in synergy with those values. Oh, that sounded weirdly corporate. Uh, <laughs> we have values, and there are tools that work with those values, and these are tools like information processing, as vague as information processing, coming more concrete toward things like open source software or using cryptography to allow trustless interactions, um, decentralization I would include in things like this, the ability to do incentive engineering is another one of these tools. And even though we don't use all of them, it doesn't mean that we believe in the values they represent any less. And from those, we build infrastructure that incorporates those values and preserves those values. And so from an overarching perspective, that is the philosophy for research. It's definitely valid to think about how does this differ from engineering? And there is a clear difference between the perception that research is this aimless and exploratory thing where if you try and put deadlines on it, you will be sorely disappointed. Whereas engineering is often goal-driven and deadline-driven and you have product managers and you have people who understand what users want. And so if you try to fit many of the things that Protocol Labs is currently doing, you'll see that much of it looks more like engineering by these perceptions. But we are definitely engaging in what I would call curiosity-driven research within every engineering project as well as beyond and external to the engineering projects. I would not consider this aimless research. Part of the research development and deployment lab is to have topic-driven research where we want to develop toolkits, improve the set of uh, cryptographic tools to enable better trustless interactions, or improve on the, the incentive systems within open source software to make open source projects more sustainable. And so this could be small projects 
within larger projects, or small questions within larger projects, or it could be these nascent new, uh, independent projects that almost seem unrelated until you take a step back and reflect on the overall values of protocol labs. We do this, re we've already been doing research like this, both internally and externally. Um, we have a few independent researchers I'd like to highlight the SourceCred project. Um, you can go check it out. It's very interesting and deserves more time than I would allow it here. Um, as well as having some mix of internal and external venues like the Research Office Hours, if you haven't heard of it, every Wednesday at, I believe it's not either 8 or 9 a.m. Pacific. We just have an open call for anyone who's interested in chatting about research questions. Um, and we've had a number of people from the community join and maybe and, um, either propose open problems or solu potential solutions, avenues to solutions at least, to open problems. And on the purely external side, we have open problems and requests for proposals. The latter two were outlined in a blog post that we put up on April 10th. And the first half of that would be the open problems. This is a GitHub repo where the issues describe either roadblocks that we've come across or a technological wish list where it seems like there is a hole in the puzzle, or in the puzzle and it would be really great to have a piece that would fit that hole or even a small problem where we can solve it in any specific case, but it seems to come up with slight variations time and time again, and solving it in a more general case seems like it would be a substantial academic contribution to the field that people could reuse over and over. And so in three slides, we will dive into one or two of these. Um, we currently have, well, that's nine? Um, we can dive into these. The goal was to source some more from all, all of you. And so I'm happy to, the, the plan was to talk through the development of one that, uh, with all of you as a group and then potentially split off into smaller groups and uh, have as many groups as we have ideas. And um, to complement the open problems, these are in the protocol research repo and the idea is to have a place to discuss these ideas. The hope is that eventually people will come to protocol labs um, and come to this repo in particular to post questions they have, have discussions here, and um, make use of the complement of the open problems, which is the request for proposals program, wherein we assign some amount of funding to individual pro open problems and will review applications and actually fund people to work on promising avenues for these problems. Um, this is, this has the potential to be exceedingly powerful in a field where it may be difficult to get academic funding for things that are truly impactful in the en in two engineering projects. Whereas we know the problems that are impactful to us, we have funding that we can put behind some of these problems. And optimistically, I think we could have an influence over the directions that fields move and take them from solving toy problems to solving pivotal problems that are integral to some future engineering efforts. So that's what I had. Happy to answer questions now, and then we'll move on to uh, trying out talking through some open problems. Any questions on that? What do people in the packet faster or the Ruby ecosystems do to? I mean, there's a whole bunch of problems that have been identified over the last few years that are spread out through GitHub or anything like that. Um, how can we? What what should what effort should we do to review those and select some that are good candidates for open problems? Uh, 
so I think you summarized the, pro the, the question well, the last sentence of what would we like out of the libp2p and ipfs teams to make um, ideas that have been discovered make questions that have been discovered at the forefront of the development into this open problem rfp pipeline and my answer to that would be that the first step would be to just go to protocol slash research slash issues and create a new issue um, call it a draft open problem, and we will, we being the community, people who follow this, or who watch this repo, can comment on the issues, refine them, and once they have reached the level of formality that is necessary to have a, a problem statement that has clearly satisfiable conditions, then we'll label it with uh, the official open problem tag, which you'll see here. Um, we, I've tagged the ones that are open, official open problem statements as well as ones that have RFPs open. Um, this is a bit out of date because the, the bottom three are not actually open at the moment. Seems like something where thinking it through, like, thinking, yeah, I get, actually, that's uh, right here in the general cases. <laughs> We've solved it so many times, specifically. Uh, we have a problem in IPFS right now that uh, DHTs scale really well in horizontally, um, but that's, no matter how far you scale horizontally, it doesn't increase the vertical scaling of DHTs. Um, this more specifically, if every single node in the DHT is only putting like a constant number of items to the DHT, it scales fine, no matter how many nodes you have, it scales well. Uh, but if every, if every single node or even some small number of nodes are putting an unbounded amount of content to the DHT, um, it doesn't scale that well. Which is fine because IPVS doesn't put a lot of content to the DHT. But what IPFS does put a lot of into the DHT right now is called provider records. So when you need to find content, you have to look it up. You have to figure out who has this piece. Um, and now in order for IPFS, in order to provide random access, we provide every single hash of a graph. So if you have a graph that's like, you know, a petabyte of files, each of those is one 256K node. So like millions and millions and millions. And so if you want to, if you tell IPFS to provide that petabyte of data, it's going to send, you know, billions of DHT puts out, uh, which doesn't work. It just breaks things. So we need to find a solution to this problem. How can you have IPFS users that have petabytes of data and it be, make it accessible to the rest of the network without completely dosing the network? Um, this thread has gotten pretty long. It's about two years old now. Um, it poses the problem and discusses a bunch of solutions pretty well, but it's definitely still an open problem. Um, I'm at the point right now where I think our solution is going to be a, like thousands of small little improvements that just add up to making it reasonably work at some given scale. Um, it's hard. Um, Juan?
Um, yeah, I, I, so like I specify the problem here. Um, I, spec I go through a bunch of potential solutions, uh, talk about what's good, what's bad in each of them, um, and then talk about a little bit more of different things. And then, um, yeah, the problem, like over the course of like interacting with people, the problem is very well teased out here. Uh, but I think I just need to go through and like condense this into a like one or two paragraph precise problem statement that is like properly abstracted. Properly abstracted for research people. 